most writers now are making it a line of dialogue in which a character directly states the theme, okay, like the second Wonder Woman movie. There's that opening sequence. How is story maps different from other methods that are out there, say like uh, Save the Cat? Save the Cat, I have a lot of problems with. Um, I think it did a really good job at the time it came out of uh, making uh, beat sheets and dramatic elements in a screenplay more accessible to newer writers. But I don't agree with a lot of Blake Snyder's uh, categorizations. Um, I think that his method, the original Blake Snyder beat sheet, was designed for his genre, which is family comedy, commercial family comedies, or high concept, high concept comedies. Um, like he used uh, Miss Congeniality as one of his pure examples in the book. And it was a great example, and it's, it's good screenwriting, it's a high concept, fun movie, but it does, I don't think his method applies to every genre, whereas I think my story map is general enough that it can apply to any genre. And in my books, I do break down uh, movies of all genres. And then now with TV, TV shows of all genres. With Save the Cat, the beat sheet specifically, there are beats in there that I just don't think are beats, okay? So it opens with opening image. Well, an opening image isn't a beat. It's just that first description, first thing you're looking at when you start a script. And so he was saying that opening image is so important that we're gonna put it in this 10 beat beat sheet. Well, I can tell you from being a reader, you forget about the first thing, the first description on page one by the time you're halfway down page one, okay? The thing that you're looking for is is what is this compelling story? What is the drama? What, who is the main character? And what's gonna suck me in? And if you can do it with an opening image, that's great, but that's very rare. And I don't think you, as a writer, should kill yourself trying to think of an opening image. It's better to say that first beat is your opening. It's that page one to 10, um, and specifically right off the bat, one to five is really key. It's how are you starting off this story? You know, what's the first thing we see? Like in Breaking Bad, it has that great flash forward opening, you know? Um, and there is an opening image in there uh, in the original pilot script for Breaking Bad. I think it was a pair of pants flying through the air in the desert and then the, um, the RV like hits the pair of pants and keeps, keeps shooting down the road. And so now we're following the RV and then we meet Walt. But see, the fact that I can't remember what that opening image is, is kind of a testament to it didn't really matter because it was a great story and that was a great sequence. So that's an example. Um, the next one, either two or three uh, in the Blake Snyder beat sheet is called Theme Stated. And he says you want to show something or have a line of dialogue that shows the audience or reader what is the theme of this story. Well, the problem is that most writers now are making it a line of dialogue in which a character directly states the theme, okay? Like the second Wonder Woman movie. There's that opening sequence where the young Wonder Woman as a girl is going through this, uh, this like trial obstacle course thing. It's a race and she's trying to win. And she takes a detour because of factors that happen on the race. And then when she's almost winning, or maybe she wins, I, I don't remember, her mother, uh, Robin Wright, grabs her and says, you cheated, you, know, you don't cheat in life, Diana. And that was stating the theme. And I think that that writer was like, oh, we have to have theme stated on page three of this screenplay and minute five of the movie. But that's not a beat. That's just telling the audience and a telling not showing because a lot of writers, unfortunately, aren't gonna show it in a really active, compelling, surprising way. That's not a beat that advances the story necessarily. Now, if you can combine it with something that advances the story, that would be great. But you don't always need it in that position. So I tell my writers, express your theme through the actions, through the beats, you know, through the drama of the story. Um, it should be clear to us what this is about. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be right away that you can settle into that as you go on through the pilot or the script. 
So, but it should be clear eventually that this is what this story is about, this is what it's exploring. But to say it directly, to state it, I think is too on the nose. Whereas Sid Field, his teachings resonated with you? Yeah, yeah, I mean, he was the original and um, I mean, I don't remember if he said show don't tell in his book then, but he probably expressed that, you know, this is a visual medium and so you want to show us something um, rather than explaining everything in dialogue. Just to, just to play devil's advocate, do you think that at the time Sid Field wrote his book and, and then the time that Blake Schneider wrote his book, that just the audiences were receiving content in a different mindset? I don't know. I mean, pro I will say prob probably movies were tighter and shorter when Blake Snyder put out his first book, you know. Um, if you look at films from like the 70s and early 80s, which I think Sid Field's book came out in like 80 or 81, um, they are looser in storytelling. They're slower and they last longer. So, um, you know, the act one of a movie in the 70s might be more like 40, 45 minutes. But by the time you get to the 90s, it's almost always 30 minutes, around 30 minutes, you know. And there are a lot of classic movies that also have that structure, like Sunset Boulevard, which I break down in my book. That's one of the reasons. I was blown away by it because I watched it for the first time as an adult. And it's like exactly 100 minutes. It's exactly in modern structure and story map structure. So I thought that was really cool. I know a lot of people say they've seen the save, save the catization of movies over time that they they're just like okay that's that's theme stated and that's dark night of the soul and you can just go down the go down the list i don't i think that's probably a little bit true that hollywood maybe follows it a little bit too much but that's true i think that's true of cliche storytelling in general you know um, there's a way to hit this Blake Snyder beat sheet in great, surprising, compelling ways like we've talked about, just as there are in my beat sheet for story maps, you know. What is a story map? A story map is my uh, very powerful tool that I developed uh, from being a reader and a writer and um, studying lots of classic movies and television shows because I have different story map templates for TV and for film. And basically it's a very powerful outline that breaks down the foundational elements of your story, which I call the basic story map. And those are those uh, basic, really important things, your protagonist, their external and internal goal, the theme, the central dramatic question to the story, which is kind of like the main engine, um, the obstacles standing in their way. And you have to really have that stuff before you go to the beat sheet which is your signpost beats, <clears throat> the markers in the story. And for example, uh, I, I give them names like opening, inciting incident, strong movement forward, uh, event and turn at the end of act one, and it's split into act one, act two A, act two B, act, act three, uh, with TV, one hour TV is usually uh, teaser plus four acts or teaser plus five acts. And then half hour TV is usually teaser or cold open plus three acts. And so I break it down very specifically uh, into page ranges. You don't have to hit a specific page point, but it should generally be in that, in that range because that is the industry standard. And I learned this from studying professional screenplays for both film and TV. And I saw what do the pros do? You know, what is it that is, um, bought and sold what uh, establishes a pro writer versus an amateur. And they do use this basic structure, which I call the story map. How is the story map different from everything else that's out there? Well, I think my uh, categories and categorization is different than other methods. I think it's more specific. I think it's more based on uh, professional work and successful work in both the movies and television. I think I've probably analyzed more films and TV than a lot of uh, authors of other books. I mean, I don't know for sure, but um, I know I've spent a lot of time on my method and I developed a lot of it while I was on the job working as a professional reader for studios and production companies. 
So I know that it also has an industry standard element to it and a professional element to it. But as far as the, um, the categorizations, like in my beat sheet, I think I, I go into more detail in describing them so that there's uh, more guidance for the writer. Do you have a story map that you can show us from a popular movie in your book? Um, yeah, my original book, Story Maps, which is uh, how, to, how to Write a Great Screenplay. It's about movies, about features. Um, there's a lot of great movies that I break down in here. Um, as Good As It Gets is, a, is one that I really like. It's a romantic dramedy. Um, there's a lot of comedy, there's a lot of drama. And it pretty much follows uh, the story map uh, really well. Um, it's a little bit longer of a film, but uh, I believe the first act is definitely around 30, 30 minutes, you know, which is pretty standard. Even with longer films, the first act tends to be about half an hour. It's just kind of uh, the way storytelling has evolved on screen. Um, but I just think it's a great example of storytelling for film, um, really compelling protagonist. He's got a lot of quirks and misbehaviors. You know, he's, his main one is OCD, he's obsessive, and he has this germophobia, and that's getting in the way of his, any relationship, whether it's his friendship with his neighbor, um, with his gay neighbor, and, or his uh, possible relationship with his uh, waitress, Helen Hunt. And so he's been pushing people away this whole time, but his true goal is to let people in, you know, to actually develop healthy relationships. Is there any way you could take us a little bit through the story map for As Good As It Gets? I know there's a lot of moments, it might be too sure, long. Sure, yeah, there's a lot of great thing. moments. Um, let me refresh myself with my book here. <laughs> um, I love the opening. It establishes Jack Nicholson um, as just this really cantankerous guy, and it kind of shows us everything about him. Um, a woman, a neighbor comes to his door, uh, or he walks out his door, and there's a neighbor who says, it's tulip season, it's such, a, it's such a wonderful day, I'm going outside, and, and she sees him and just glowers at him like she knows this guy just puts the kibosh on any fun. And then uh, Melvin Udall, Jack Nicholson, finds his neighbor's dog sniffing around, and he doesn't like dogs. You know, he's a germaphobe and everything, and he picks up the dog and he stuffs him down the trash chute. <laughs> And it turns out, so then his neighbor comes out, which is Greg Kinnear, looking for this dog, and he lies and says he hasn't seen a dog, you know? So it's just such a great way of just showing what a jerk this guy is, you know? Then he goes back into his apartment and we see all the OCD rituals, you know? He's washing his hands with scalding hot water and soap, and he, he um, turns the lock, he has a bunch of locks on his door, he turns them a sp certain number of times, in ways he has all these rituals and those are going to tie in in the end because when he finally uh, achieves his arc and he gets Helen Hunt to love him and he is selfless with his neighbor and he's a good friend to his neighbor he realizes he didn't lock the door so it's a visual device that he's gotten over some of these uh, problem you know these problems and obsessions that he had so they do it in a showing, not telling way. 